The letter is presented by Hunt a Killer. If you love intricate puzzles and unpredictable mysteries, Hunt a Killer could be exactly what you've been waiting for. They make immersive murder mystery games where you get to be the detective. You can pick from standalone one shot criminal cases, longer multi chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. They also make great gifts for the game, mystery, or true crime lover in your life. Solve a mystery, hunt a killer. Go to huntakiller.com slash the letter and use the code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. If you need the news, but also need to feel smarter and calmer, then you need to get in Andy Slavitt's bubble. Andy is a former White House advisor and the ultimate outsider's insider. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Andy offers his access to leading experts. Join Andy for discussions on COVID, gun violence, climate change, and more. In the Bubble with Andy Slavitt is available wherever you get your podcasts. Lemonada. A warning to listeners. This podcast includes descriptions of gun violence and associated trauma. Please take care when listening. I sit in my living room and everywhere I looked, I would see Zach. Sitting on the couch playing his guitar, walking through the door, saying, Mama, I'm home, you know, and I was sobbing. I was just sitting there sobbing and this was quite a while, just missing him. In the months after Sai Snar's son was murdered, grief saturated every moment. I remember looking up, and my oldest son was standing there, and he just looked so sad. When I looked at him, he, he just walked out of the room. That was the kick in my gut, I think, that I needed. When he saw me so upset and he looked so sad and just turned around and left the room, I realized I had let the death of one child become more important than the lives of three more that I loved ever bit as much as Zach. And it, it just brought me up short, like, what am I doing? What am I doing to my family? I just knew that I had to change, but I didn't think I could towards my feelings for Jorge Benvenuto. From KSL Podcasts, I'm Amy Donaldson, and this is The Letter. Episode 5, Putting Down the Rocks. The Snars hoped that the sentencing of George Benvenuto would bring closure, that he would be locked away for the rest of his life, and that they could somehow forget about him. But George's legal team threw a wrench into that plan. They wanted to withdraw his guilty plea. That meant the families involved would be left in legal limbo for years. The idea that the Snars could put this behind them turned out to be a mirage. In the meantime, Sai had to go on living. But how do you sit through a parent-teacher conference or consider what to make for dinner when everything reminds you of what you've lost? I didn't want to leave the house. I didn't... I just would curl up in the fetal position, honestly. It was just so painful, and just that pain, and then the anger, I anger at everything and everybody. I was angry at him, obviously. I was angry at God for allowing this to happen to my son. I I would see other 18-year-olds out there, and I'd think, why are you here and my son not? And I know that's totally irrational, Mm -hmm. but that's where I was at that time. I'd see people out running and laughing, and I think, how can they do that? Was I ever that way? And I thought, I'll never be happy again. I really, truly believed I will never be happy again. I can't smile, I can't laugh. It was, it was just so devastating. I personally had never seen anyone with such a physical manifestation of grief. Sai's neighbor and close friend, Drew Weglin clark witnessed the worst of it. 
just when you hugged her, you could just broken. I mean, just distraught. Yeah, but you could see that she was in pain. Oh, absolutely. Feel it. See it. Drew moved into the neighborhood back in 1978, the year Zach was born. I remember him especially as a little boy in overalls, just a darling, darling little child. She admired how the Snars raised their children. And Drew was there when Cy gave birth to their youngest son, Levi. I remember that well because I was pregnant with my first child and I was watching her intensely. And they were a great role model about how to raise a family. All the kids knew how to work, how to get things done, but they also knew how to have great family times and fun. Zach's older sister, Sydney, says it was fun growing up a snar. I I grew up in a really happy home. My childhood was ideal. I, I loved my brothers. They loved me, my parents were excellent. We just had so much laughter and joy in our home, and really, we were a family that truly loved and enjoyed each other. So after Zach died, my parents just, we were changed. No more family pictures, no more family vacations, no more family dinners, because how could it be called that when we were missing, you know, our heart? Sydney didn't just lose her brother. She lost the larger-than-life woman who raised her. She lost her prank-pulling, joke-telling dad. My mom was, she was always such a fun, energetic, passionate person who just loved to grab life by the horns. You know, everything was, oh, you know, nothing. (laughs) It was never like a, like if, if a, a, taco was good. She, it wasn't like, this is a good taco. She was just like, oh, it's to die for. And oh, this is the best taco. And, you know, everything was in caps and exclamation points and emojis (laughs) with my mom before. (laughs) And uh, suddenly she just, she lost that sparkle for a long time. um, She was so, she just became quiet and she uh, just was so into her grief that I think for a while she just had to withdraw from all of us, which, which I get. Um, And then my dad, he was, beforehand, he was just this fun, loving, big laughter, you know, we, we, he laughs with his whole body and just this fun magnet for people, right? And afterwards, he was so sad. We had a dog that we had had for about a year before Zach died, and my dad wanted nothing to do with it. And then Zach died. And after that, I'd I'd look outside and see my dad sitting on the porch with the dog just sitting next to him, and my dad would just have his arm around our golden retriever and would just be crying into his neck. He just, he was so alone. Their individual heartbreak somehow isolated them from each other in ways they'd never experienced. I knew I needed help. We all did. But I would go home and I'd see how traumatized and depressed and anguished my parents were. And I was like, I can't, I can't add to that. And Trent did the same and Levi did the same. And we all just suffered on our own. I knew my family was there for me, and they knew I was there for them. But it's like, you just, how can I add to your burden? Sai desperately wanted to change for the sake of her living children. But she didn't know how to live and love with such sadness and rage. She sought help from a counselor. What I liked about it was that she let me yell and scream and say how I was feeling and didn't tell me, you can't feel that way. You know, so many people right from the get-go, you have to forgive him. And it made me so angry. Like, I don't have to forgive him. I will never forgive him. I don't want to ever forgive him, you know. And even my own sister 
you have to forgive him. Were you even able to discuss forgiving him? No, no. I mean, I'm sure they had good reasons. People would why. say that. Yeah, yeah I and I said it. it's not going to happen. I don't want to. You know, I hate him. I said that so many times. I hate him. Never had I felt that amount of hatred towards another human being where I was literally obsessed with it and it overtook who I was. And Sai wasn't alone in her hatred. It consumed the entire family. My youngest son, Levi, who was only 15 at the time, I think I saw the biggest change in him. He just plummeted and he was so angry and he would pick, he was a big kid. He was 6'4". I always Mm -hmm. called him my gentle giant because he was so sweet (laughs) to me. But he he would pick fights, and that was his outlet, unfortunately. And he'd come home sometimes with big bruises, <laughs> and I worried because he said so many times, "I want to kill him. I'm, I'm I want to kill him." And I kind of got it because for a long time I did too. But it scared me to hear my youngest son say that. But over time, Sai says, something shifted for Levi. He just went out of the blue one night and said, you know, I wouldn't kill him. I wouldn't kill him anymore. I might still hurt him bad, but I wouldn't kill him. (laughs) And that was huge. He did a total turnaround. He, He started exercising and he was happy again. And that made me so happy to to have him back, his sweet, because he was so sweet. My protector, I always called him my protector. Because he'd always put his arm around me, I'll protect you, Mama. (laughs) Gradually, Drew says she started to see glimpses of the friends that she knew and loved. She tried to plan outings with Sai and Ron to pull them back into some semblance of normal life. One of those was taking Sai to a movie. I can't remember the movie. It was kind of a comedy, and she laughed hysterically. And I was like, this is great. She's laughing. I didn't watch the movie. I was more watching her reaction. While the heaviness of grief was always there, Sydney said there were moments of joy. Just over a year after Zach's death, Sydney got married. I remember when I got married, my mom was like, we need to have make this a party because we need something to celebrate. We, we have to have something to look forward to. And then came the first grandchild. Zachary Taylor Davis, born in October of 2000. They called him Taylor, but he would carry Zach's name. And my life changed. I was like so in love with this boy. (laughs) And I remember they lived in New Hampshire at the time and I was up in his nursery rocking him. It was just him and me. And I started just talking to him and he was an infant, a newborn. And I just started talking to him about Zach and I'm not making this up, and I'm not kidding, his eyes, he looked right at me, and he just started just like trying to say something. I know he was. It's like he knew what I was saying. Hmm. And I thought, you know him. You know Zach. I know he did. And it's like he couldn't communicate. But I, that's always been such a spe- I don't think I've ever, ever even told Taylor about that, but it was really special to me. I think with my parents, the burden really started to lighten with the birth of their grandkids. Being a grandparent for my parents brings them, like, so much joy. My parents took on that role with just gusto. Like, they ate it up. And so that was when things started to kind of lift. Sydney had four children. Trent got married and had three. His firstborn son was also named Zachary, Zachary Snar. Sai and Ron refer to them as the seven wonders of the world. However, I will say that my marriage, the birth of all four kids, all of their little milestones that they've hit, all of their accomplishments, all of the joy that we've had, There has always been that dark shadow there with us. I've carried this rage on my shoulders, and my parents have, and my brothers have, for a long time. And every every good thing that happened 
that ugly sludge of hatred and anger and rage and sadness was there with us. You know, I the birth of my child, I was 99% happy. And then there was that, you know, it was there. It was always there. Motherhood gave Sydney unique insight into her own mother's pain. I remember the very first time my my oldest son, Taylor, when he was born, the doctors put him in my arms and I looked down at him and I just started crying. And I looked at my mom who was in the room and I just said, how, how did you do it? Like, I, I, I can't imagine. I, it was so hard to lose a brother. And I look at my children and I can't, I, I, I can't even, I won't allow myself to imagine because it, it's too painful, it's too overwhelming. After the break, Sai is offered the chance to meet with her son's killer. I'm really excited to tell you about The Jordan Harbinger Show which is a podcast that we think the listeners of The Letter will also enjoy in their podcast queue. In every episode of this show, Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people, from athletes, authors, and scientists, to FBI agents, political activists, and even hostage negotiators. Jordan Harbinger has an undeniable talent for getting his guests to share stories that they may never have shared publicly before. His conversations are full of never-been-heard-before stories and thought-provoking insights. And without fail, he pulls out tactical bits of wisdom from each guest, and you can't help but be a more informed, critical thinker. A recent episode had me examining my own life. It was with financial psychologist Dr. Brad Klontz on how our financial choices are often the result of beliefs and habits that were instilled in us as children. It was fascinating. But honestly, with new episodes every week coming out weekly, the top spot for my favorite episode is constantly evolving. You cannot go wrong with adding The Jordan Harbinger Show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting, and there's never a dull show. Go to jordanharbinger.com slash start for more episode recommendations, or search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. In my life, there's never enough time to read all the great books that have been written. My days are spent on the move, which is why Audible is one of my favorite apps. While I love reading, there is also something about listening to a story that feels different, maybe slightly more intimate. The best part of Audible is that I can listen while I hike, clean my house, or run errands. Audible has an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, self-help, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, I get to choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog. Right now, I'm listening to The Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead. It's based on what happened at a real reform school in Florida for more than 111 years. It's gut-wrenching, maddening, and completely captivating. I also just finished Between Two Kingdoms, a memoir by Sulika Jawad, who spent her early 20s battling leukemia. This one is read by the author, and it's so beautifully written about where the best and worst parts of our lives overlap that I had to buy the hard copy so I could scribble some notes as I listened. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it for free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500. That's audible.com slash the letter or text the letter to 500-500 to try Audible for free for 30 days. Audible.com slash the letter. As the years went by, Sai couldn't help wondering if Jorge Benvenuto ever thought about Zach. Jorge had never spoken in court, and she wanted to know if he was sorry. Then, in 2003, seven years after her son's murder, she met someone who worked for a restorative justice program, and she was offered the chance to meet with Jorge. And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to do that, because I thought, surely he's sorry. Sai <laughs> attended training to prepare for the experience. 
And so I went through all the training and I didn't tell my family because I thought they would not agree with me that I should do this, but I just did it. She didn't want to go alone, so she asked a friend to accompany her. They both had to undergo background checks and they did everything they were asked to do. What I didn't know, however, was that no one had talked to George about the program. No one had asked him if he wanted to meet with the mother of the man that he'd killed. So Sai and her friend were all ready to go to the prison. Then they went and approached him after I was ready to go. And they said they were talking to him. He just said they're kind of nodding. And then afterwards, he said, no, I'm not really interested and got up and left. After all that, they told her Jorge did not want to speak to her. And it's like, what? Oh, I was so angry. I thought, how dare he deny me this? The failed meeting sent her into a tailspin. She went through all of this expecting to learn something that might help her understand why her son was murdered. She hoped for an apology. Instead, Sai felt her suspicions that George had no regard for Zach or his family were confirmed. So it kind of set me back, you know? It set me back and I was really angry. A decade after Zach's murder in 2006, there was a court hearing where Jorge Benvenuto attempted to withdraw his guilty plea. Sai was allowed to speak and at one point she addressed him directly asking the questions that had tortured her for years. What did I say? Yeah. (laughs) I probably wasn't very nice. I'm sure I wasn't. I talked a lot about Zach and how amazing he was and what this had done to my family. I had always just wanted to know why. And I said, I guess the only person who can answer that is Jorge. And I looked right at him. I said, so was it worth it to watch someone die? And I just stood there. And he he looked at me for one brief split second, looked back down and never said anything. He never said anything in court. They gave him the chance and he never did. The district judge turned down George's request to withdraw his guilty plea, saying his claim lacked merit and it came too late. But his legal team appealed once again and it went all the way to the Utah Supreme Court. In July of 2007, the court ruled the plea could not be withdrawn because it was made due to overwhelming evidence of guilt. Jorge Benvenuto's life sentence without the possibility of parole would stand. Then I thought it's really over. And it was, but it took 11 years. Waiting so long for justice felt unfair to Ron took 11 years, and it's a done deal. You know, there's an eyewitness, an eyewitness to the crime, and 11 years in court. That what You know, there's something wrong with the justice system, I still think. Just a few months before the Supreme Court put an end to legal battles, life dealt the Snars another devastating blow. Their youngest son, Levi, sized gentle giant, her protector, was diagnosed with cancer. He had a very rare cancer, it's epithelioid sarcoma, which is, they told us from the get-go, there's no cure. I said, you just treat him because there's someone with more power than you, because I truly believed I would not lose another son. Caring for Levi became Sai's purpose. In the wake of Zach's death, both Ron and Sai showered their youngest son with more attention and affection. Levi, he was the baby boy, and, and after Zach died, he, he was never told no. You know, he got a brand new truck every year. Ron said he'd go on trips to the Snake River in Wyoming with Levi and a group of his friends, and Levi would drive the pack truck with a kind of recklessness that sometimes scared Ron. You know, he'd be going up the canyon 90 miles an hour. We'd go river running, and six guys, six, eight guys in the truck, and it was raining. He's going 80 miles an hour up the canyon, you know, and I'm saying, Levi. Levi, please slow down. He says, Dad, this is my truck and I'll drive it that I want. Then when Levi got sick, 
He had to go to chemotherapy twice a day. And Ron took the wheel. And now the shoe's on the other foot, and I'm bringing him home from the hospital, and he's dying. He's just deteriorating in front of me. And uh, he said, Dad, you're even with me. He says, you're the driver. Your driver's scaring the hell out of me. <laughs> I, I always laugh. I said, well, you deserve it. <laughs> he says, your driving's killing me. The teasing was their way of beating back more heartbreak. And I was in his truck and everything, yeah. and... and uh, he said, Dad, when I, when I pass, he says, sell my truck. And I said, okay, Levi. Why did he want to sell it? He just didn't want me to have it because he knew it was too hard on me. Eventually, the treatments became too much for Levi. Before the cancer, Levi had a goal to visit all of the seven continents with his mother. They had been to six when he began his treatments. Only Africa remained on the bucket list. And he, he just said, you know, I'm, I'm going to quit my treatments. He says, I want to, I'm going to quit my treatments and I want to go to Africa and then I'm going to go live with my brother. And uh, that's what he did. Six weeks after they got home from Africa, Levi died. He was buried next to his brother. The two sons occupy the plots that were originally intended for Sai and Ron. The cruelty of losing both of their boys was debilitating. Yeah, I, I wanted to die for a long time. I used to think, why would anybody want to die? I just, I, how could anybody be that depressed? You know, I never understood it. I get it. I get what it's like to be that depressed, where you literally do not want to get out of bed. I did not want to get out of bed. I did not want to go on with my life. I wanted to die. While Sai was drowning in despair, Ron was consumed with rage. This time, there was no one to blame. When Levi died, it was, I say, like the straw that broke the camel's back with him. To lose two sons, he just was angry. And I know one time there was a bad lightning storm and he was up at the University of Utah out on the um, baseball field, I believe. And he, he just put his arms up and said, come and take me, God. Take me, you know, strike me down. I mean, he, he was like me. It's like, what are, you know, what is going on here? We've lost half our, you know, these two amazing sons, different, oh, totally different ways, but both were so painful. And you're just trying to get over, you know, get on with losing one and kind of get into where you think, okay, I, I'm surviving this day by day, you know, and then we lose another one. And it was just too much. After the break, Sai decides it's time for a change. Tired of the same old game nights? Bored with the same old board games or card games? Looking for a fun new activity to do with your family, your partner, your friends, or even by yourself? You should check out Hunt a Killer. With Hunt a Killer, you get to be the detective, sorting through evidence, piecing together clues, and solving the case in an immersive murder mystery game. Each Hunt a Killer box is a complete murder mystery that you have to solve. Pick from standalone one-shot crimes, longer multi-chapter mystery boxes, jigsaw puzzles, books, or an exclusive monthly subscription storyline that unfolds over six months. Just like real detective work, you must establish means, motive, and opportunity for each suspect. It's like your own episode of CSI combined with an escape room. I received the Dead on the Vine box, which was a twisting, turning, totally consuming whodunit. In this game, the family's matriarch is poisoned, and the killer had to be a member of her family. We loved the ciphers, puzzles, and secrets we had to uncover in solving the crime. And because I've not so secretly wanted to be a private detective since I was a kid, I can't wait to start my next case. Take the case at huntakiller.com slash the letter and use code the letter for $10 off your purchase. That's huntakiller.com slash the letter and code the letter. Now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. A good therapist can help you become a better problem solver, making it easier to accomplish your goals, no matter how big or small. And BetterHelp Online Therapy can give you access to the right therapist for you. If I can share a little bit about my own mental health struggles. As a survivor of domestic abuse, therapy became my lifeline. 
a way out of what felt like endless darkness and pain. It has helped me more effectively manage problems throughout my life, some of them big and complicated like PTSD, while others are more mundane like phases of life changes. I just recently started using BetterHelp, and I'm a huge fan, not just of what they do, but how they do it. Being able to talk with a licensed therapist who is matched with me and my specific needs in my own home, sometimes at times that a traditional therapist wouldn't be available, has been life-changing. I am so grateful for BetterHelp. BetterHelp can match you with a therapist after you fill out a brief survey, and you can switch therapists anytime. Honestly, this process was much easier and much faster than the traditional routes I've used in the past. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, accessible, affordable, and entirely online. When you want to become a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash the letter today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash the letter. Sai says the five years after Levi's death were hell. She was tired of grief. She was tired of being angry. Her rage turned her into a person she didn't recognize. She knew she wanted to change, but she did not know how. When you have that much hatred and anger in you, you become that. You are angry and hateful. I didn't like it. I didn't like what I had become. Then Sai got a call from a woman at her church who wanted to give a talk about forgiveness. The story she wanted to tell was about a victim of a murder. And the woman was worried that if she spoke at church, it might upset Sai. And I said, actually, I'd kind of like to hear it. You know, I'd, I'd be interested to hear it. She just gave this most amazing talk about that. And it just hit me. I thought, I want to be like that. I want to feel that. I want to be able to forgive him, you know? And uh, it was a process. I've likened it to backpacks full of rocks (laughs) that you have to let go a little at a time. You may have heard of this backpack full of rocks. It's a common analogy used in the mental health field that helps people visualize how anger, stress, and shame can create an emotional weight that we might not even be aware we're carrying with us. The idea is to take out a rock, acknowledge what you've been carrying, and then put it down. The goal, eventually, is to empty the backpack. It doesn't happen overnight. It did not happen overnight for me. Sai says it took about 15 years until she was able to finally let go. It was a slow and deliberate process. You know, I just quit thinking about it. I quit thinking about him. I quit hating him. I quit quit dwelling on him. And I just thought, you know, I, I've got to go on. It was a matter of shifting her focus from the way her son was killed to the way her son lived. And every time I found myself thinking about it, which was often, because I thought about every day for years, you do, you, you know, it's something hard to not think about. But I would just make, I'd force my mind to go somewhere else. And after a while I realized, you know, I'm not thinking about Zach's death. I thought about his life. A, I still do every day and and celebrate it, you know, just how grateful I was to have him for 18 years and how awesome he was, you know, but I just couldn't dwell on his death. Ron followed his wife's lead, eventually realizing that the hatred he'd harbored was only hurting him and those he loved. The only one I was hurting or killing was myself. And I'm, and I'm so sick of it, you know. I says, I've destroyed, I've destroyed myself and everybody around me. You know, nobody likes to be around me. <laughs> and I can see their point. Ron says it took him about 18 years, the length of Zach's life. He remembers talking to a woman from church, a full-time missionary. They were riding together in a truck for several hours to make a delivery at a girls' camp in Wyoming. She rode with me to girls' camp, and you know, I said, you know what I'm doing? I'm going to forgive Jorge. The pain of it all is killing me. 
You know, it's destroyed me. And so Jesus was right. Love one another. He taught us the, the whole gospel is about love. And it's just not love the people you love. It's love everybody, even those who wrong me. Because Jesus can forgive them. We all can. Once Ron and Sai decided to let go of their anger, they found it opened up possibilities that had been closed to them for years. The weight of the world lifted off my shoulder and I can, I can be nice and I can smile and I can laugh. Everybody's got their own problems, you know, and I've got to live with mine and I'm going to do better with it. I'm going to change me first and then try to help everybody change themselves too, you know. If I can do it, they can do it. You know, I've gone through a lot. <laughs> I, carried, I carried the hatred for so long. I had total forgiveness for him. And it changed my life for so much better. So much better just to let go of that burden, this weight that's on you all the time. It was like, this huge weight lifted from me. So I thought she had made it to a good place, as good as it would get in her lifetime. She began to feel lighter, happier. Although sometimes, she still yearned for the chance to talk to her son's killer. I wished I could tell him I'd forgiven him. I'll never get that chance. But Saya was wrong. She would have that chance. She and Ron had no idea how things would change with the arrival of a letter. Before we tell you about that letter and the impact that it had on the SNARS, we're going to find out what happens to the survivor, Yvette Rodier. The fact that she lived and Zach didn't haunts all of her decisions as she struggles to reclaim her life. Next time on The Letter. There must be a reason I'm here, right? I still, I need to do something. There's got to be some sort of purpose. When it comes to forgiveness, most of us think it's a concept we understand, but it might be more complicated than we think. I'm producer Andrea Smartin, and in this week's bonus episode, Amy talks with two professionals. One is a pioneer in the scientific study of forgiveness about how it can improve physical health. Another is a psychologist and professor who put his research into practice when his mother was murdered. With the help of these experts, Amy unravels the ways we misunderstand something that can offer hope and healing to victims of trauma. You can get all the bonus content by subscribing to Lemonada Premium. You can subscribe right now in the Apple Podcast app by clicking on our podcast logo and then click the subscribe button. The letter is researched and reported by me, Amy Donaldson. It's written by myself and Andreas Martin, who is also responsible for production and sound design. Mixing by Trent Sell. Special thanks to Nina Ernest, Becky Bruce, Kellyanne Halverson, Ryan Meeks, Josh Tilton, Ben Kiebrick, and Dave Colley. Main musical score composed by Allison Layton Brown. With KSL Podcast executive producer Cheryl Worsley. For Lemonada Media, executive producers Jessica Cordova Kramer and Stephanie Whittleswax. And executive producers Paul Anderson and Nick Pinella with Workhouse Media. If you like our show, please give us a rating and a review. It helps people find us. Follow us at theletterpodcast.com and on social at the letter podcast. 
We've been hearing from some of you about your experience with the podcast, and we would love to hear more. If you have a comment or question for us, please leave us a voicemail at 801-575-4398. That's 801-575-4398. We may play it on the show or in a bonus episode. The letter is produced by KSL Podcasts and Lemonada Media in association with Workhouse Media. Hey, The Letter listeners, we want to hear from you. You know we love our sponsors for a ton of reasons, but one of the main ones is because they help us keep the lights on. And there's a really easy way that you can help us draw new advertisers and hear ads for things that you're most interested in. Filling out our quick anonymous survey at lemonadamedia.com slash survey. By answering just a few questions, you can help us find new brands to connect with and also share feedback about show content you'd like to see across the network. And to sweeten the deal, once you've completed the survey, you can enter for a chance to win a $100 Visa gift card. I promise the survey is short and sweet and will help us play ads you don't want to skip. And also, keep bringing you content you love. Just go to lemonadamedia.com survey. The Webby Award-winning series The Untold Story is back for Season 3. In Season 1, The Untold Story took a deep dive into the pitfalls of modern policing. The second season explored the failings of the American court system. In this new season, host Trayvon Free shines a light on human rights violations that are taking place right before our eyes in America. Each episode contains tangible, real strategies to begin enacting positive change in our communities. All three episodes of Untold Story, Criminal Injustice from Lemonada Media premiere on October 25th, wherever you get your podcasts.